Hare Krishna everyone. Welcome back to the daily readings of Srila Prabhupada's books. We're here at the live studios in Iskand Bhaktivedanta Ashram, just across the street from Govardhan Hill, Haridasa Varyo, the dearest devotee of Sri Krishna and Balarama. Um, I just had a talk with a, an old friend named Gopinath Prasad, South Africa. He's highly efficient and organized and professional when it comes to um, anything internet, anything that has to do with internet. He recently was responsible for wiring internet-wise the uh, Echo Village concept uh, that the devotees in Bombay uh, are doing. I don't remember exactly where it is, but it's become quite a project. And he's responsible for having wired it to the point where the internet is perfect. And in India, that's not easy to do, as you may have guessed already from the different times. The reception isn't perfect or the connection isn't perfect. <clears throat> anyway, to make a long story short, it was Gopinath Prasad three years ago who heard what I was doing to read, because at that time I was reading to whoever was around, wherever I was, and he was so excited about it. He said, Maharaj, you have to start uh, broadcasting this live stream. You can do it very easily through Facebook. And at that point in my life, I wasn't into doing that because I didn't want to put myself out there due to my, I don't know what, complex. And, uh, but then when later, the idea went in, but I didn't do anything about it until about, you know, now it's been about two years, between a year and a half and two years ago, when we started actually doing live stream. And now we have almost the whole Bhagavatam completed. And when Gopinath Prasad heard and saw and watched and listened, he was amazed. And he is, he's in a transition. He's transitioning from to ashram, one ashram to another, and he's also transitioning in his profession. So, but he wants very much to help. So I'm putting this out there to all of you, our followers, because very soon, within the next month or two, we'll be in a position to build a team to increase the, the, the scope of it, the, the, viewer, the viewers, and so many things. Maybe bringing out, a, we've already talked to some of you about bringing it out into, into YouTube, which is more, it, it's easy to organize things and makes things more accessible in a different way than in Facebook. But Facebook is so good because it enables everyone to speak alive to the, to the speaker. And we're going to keep it on Facebook, of course. But we can get it out of Facebook, also audio, also video, to uh, YouTube and many other, maybe other venues, because it's inspiring. And uh, so stay tuned. They may, we may be building a little team. And any of you out there who want to be a part of that team, I'm sure there'll be lots of service for you. So please stay tuned. All right, now that I've done that introduction, uh, let's get down to the actual hearing of the Srimad Bhagavatam and Srila Prabhupada's uh, followers who have completed the Bhagavatam for him uh, after the uh, from the 14th chapter of the 10th canto on through the 11th, the rest of the 10th and 11th and 12th cantos, uh, Srila Rida Nanda Maharaj, uh, Gopi Paranadana Prabhu, and Dravida Prabhu, uh, they were a team that finished the Bhagavatam uh, for Prabhupada. And there's no doubt in my mind or my heart that what we're hearing now, the depth of the purports and the expertise that were that, that manifested itself, that this was an empowered work, empowered by Śrīla Prabhupāda, and it is his Bhagavatam. Even though his disciples are, have completed it, it's, it's a great glory of Śrīla Prabhupāda that he could actually train disciples to the extent 
in dedication and expertise to actually produce this quality of transcendental literature. It's the greatest glorification of Prabhupada that I can imagine. So let us continue in this ecstasy. Uh, first, we're going to hear, as we always do every day, Srila Sanatana Goswami's glorification of the Srimad Bhagavatam so that we can go deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's no limit to how deeper we can go. There's no limit to how uh, happy you can become. Uh, there's no satiation. The more you hear the Bhagavatam, the more you want to hear the Bhagavatam. And this is our life's uh, mission now. And it's my legacy service to Srila Prabhupada. Some people at the end of their lives do memoirs or write books. This is what I'm going to do. I'm 73 years old and I don't know how long I'm going to live, but as long as I live, I'm going to continue to do this service and try to record as many of Srila Prabhupada's major works in this format, with this format, because it will be greatly helpful to keep Srila Prabhupada in the center of our movement and the empowered uh, literatures that he produced and inspired uh, will be there for generations to come. Srimad Bhagavata Mihima Stotram by Srila Sanatan Goswami. The most beautiful glorification of the Bhagavatam, at least I've ever heard. And it goes like this Sarva Shastrabdipi Yusha, Sarva Vedaika Satpala, Sarva Siddhanta Ratnadya, Sarva Lokaika Drik Prada. O nectar from the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truths, you are the only giver of sight to all the worlds. Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Srimad Bhagavata Prabho, Kalidvandodita Ditya, Sri Krishna Parivartita. O life heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master Srimad Bhagavatam, you are the sun risen in the darkness of Kali. You are the exact image of Sri Krishna. Padamananda Pataya, Prema Varshakshalayate, Sadasavasevaya, Sri Krishnaya Namostume. I bow down to you who are supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are Sri Krishna Himself. Ando Matsangin Madguroman Mahadana Manishtadaka Madbhagya Madanamostute My only friend, my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, my savior, my good fortune, my source of ecstasy, I bow down to you. Asadu saduta dayin atini chochatakada hanamun chagadachin mam prim narit anta O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O exalter of the most fallen, please never leave me. Always appear in my heart and my voice with pure love. Om namo bhagavate. Vasudivaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudivaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudivaya So we're continuing with Krishna's pastimes in Mathura. And we've reached the 48th chapter of the 10th canto entitled Krishna Pleases His Devotees. Here's the summary. In this chapter, <clears throat> Lord Sri Krishna first visits Trivakra, also known as Kubja, and enjoys with her. And then he visits Akrura. The Lord sends Akrura to Hastinapur to satisfy the Pandavas. After Uddhava had related to Sri Krishna the news of Raja, the Lord went to the home 
of Tribhakra, which was decorated with diverse ornamentation conducive to sexual enjoyment. Tribhakra welcomed, welcomed Krishna with great respect, giving him a raised seat, and together with her female companions, worshipping him. She, offered, she also offered Uddhava a seat as befitted his position, but Uddhava simply touched the seat and sat down on the floor. Lord Krishna then reclined on an opulent bed as the maidservant, Tripakra, elaborately washed and decorated herself. Then she approached him. Krishna invited Tripakra to the bed and began to enjoy with her in various ways. By embracing Lord Krishna, Tripakra freed herself of the torment of lust. She asked Krishna to remain with her for some time, and the considerate Lord promised to fulfill her request in due course. He then returned with Uddhava to his residence. Apart from offering sandal paste to Krishna, Trivikra had never performed any pious acts, yet simply on the strength of the piety of this single act, she attained the rare personal association of Sri Krishna. <clears throat> Sri Krishna next went to Akrura's house with Lord, ba with Lord Baladev and Uddhava. Akrura honored the three of them by bowing down and presenting them with suitable sitting places. Then he worshipped Rama and Krishna, washed their feet and poured the water on his head. Akrura also offered them many prayers. Lord Krishna was pleased with Akrura's prayers. He told him that since he, Akrura, was in fact their paternal uncle, Krishna and Balarama should be the recipients of his protection and mercy. <clears throat> Lord Krishna then praised Akrura as a saint and purifier of the sinful, and he asked him to visit Hastinapur to find out how the Pandavas, deprived of their father, were faring. Finally, the Lord returned home, taking Balarama and Uddhava with him. Text 1 <coughs> Shukadev Goswami said, <coughs> Next, after assimilating Uddhava's report, Lord Krishna the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the omniscient soul of all that be, desired to satisfy the serving girl, Tripakra, who was troubled by lust. Thus, he went to her house. Purport. This text gives an inter interesting insight into the Lord's pastimes. The first line says, Atabhigyaya Bhagavan. Thus the Lord understanding Uddhava's report. The second line states that Lord Krishna is the soul of everything, Sarvatma, and the seer of everything, Sarvadarshana. In other words, although he certainly does not on spoken reports from messengers, he plays the part of a human being and listens to news from not out of need, as we would do, but in the bliss of his spiritual pastimes, exchanging love with his pure devotee. The word Sarvadarshana also indicates that the Lord perfectly understood the feelings of the residents of Braja and was perfectly reciprocating with them within their hearts. Now, in his external appearance, he desired to bless Srimati Trivakra, who was about to be freed from the disease of material lust. Text 2 Trivikar's home was opulently appointed with expensive furnishings and, re and replete with sensual accru accruterments. Uh, Trivikar's home was opulently appointed with expensive furnishings and replete, replete with sensual accruterments meant to inspire sexual desire. There were banners, rows of strung pearls, canopies, fine beds and sitting places, 
and also fragrant incense, oil lamps, flower garlands, and aromatic sandalwood paste. Purport According to Sridhar Swami, the sensual accoutrements in Tribhikra's house included explicit sexual pictures. Srila Vishwanath Chakrabarti adds that her paraphernalia included herbal aphrodisiacs. It is not hard to guess Trivikra's intention, yet Lord Krishna went there to save her from material existence. Text 3 When Trivikra saw him arriving at her house, <clears throat> she at once rose from her seat in a flurry. Coming forward graciously with her girlfriends, she respectfully greeted Lord Achuta by offering him an excellent and other articles of worship. Text 4 Uddhava also received a seat of honor, since he was a saintly person, but he simply touched it and sat on the floor. Then Lord Krishna, imitating the manners of human society, quickly made himself comfortable on an opulent bed. Purport. According to the Acharyas, Uddhava felt reverence for his Lord and thus declined to sit on an opulent seat in his presence. Rather, he touched the seat with his hand and sat on the floor. Srila Vishwanath Chakrabarti adds that Lord Krishna made himself comfortable on a bed located in the inner chambers of Trivikra's home. Text 5 Trivikra prepared herself by bathing, anointing her body, and dressing in fine garments, by putting on jewelry, garlands, and perfume, and also by chewing bitter nut, drinking fragrant liquor, and so on. She then approached Lord Madhava with shy, playful smiles and coquettish glances. Purport It is clear from this verse that the ways a woman prepares for sexual enjoyment have not changed in thousands of years. <laughs> Text 6 <clears throat> Calling forward his beloved, who was anxious and shy at the prospect of this new contact, the Lord pulled her by the bangled hands under the bed. Thus he enjoyed with that beautiful girl, whose only trace of piety was her having anointed, offered anointment to the Lord. I have to read that again. Thus he enjoyed with that beautiful girl, whose only trace of piety was her having offered ointment to the Lord. Purport. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti explains that the words Nava Sangama Riya indicate that Trivakra was in fact a virgin girl at this point. She had been a deformed hunchback and the Lord had recently transformed her into a beautiful girl. Therefore, although clearly lusting after Sri Krishna, she was naturally shy and anxious. Text 7 Simply by smelling the fragrance of Krishna's lotus feet, Trivikra cleansed away the burning lust Cupid had aroused in her breasts, chest, and eyes. With the two arms, she embraced between her breasts her lover, Sri Krishna, the personification of bliss, and thus she gave up her long-standing distress. Text 8 Having thus gotten the hard-to-get Supreme Lord by the simple act of offering him body, body ointment, unfortunate Trivikra submitted to that Lord of freedom by the following request. Durbhaga, unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Purport. According to Srila Vishwanath, Chakrabarti Srimati Trivikra prayed to the Lord, Please enjoy only with me and not with any other woman. Because Krishna was not prepared to grant such a benediction, Trivikra is described here as unfortunate. Sri Swami adds that although to ordinary eyes she seemed to beg for a material sex pleasure, in fact, she was a liberated soul at this point. Text 9 Trivakra said, O beloved, please stay here with me for a few days more and enjoy. I cannot bear to give up your association, O Lotus-eyed one. Purport 
The word ambu means water, and ruha means rising. Thus, amburuha means the lotus flower which rises up from the water. Lord Krishna is called Amburuhekshana, the lotus-eyed one. He is the source and embodiment of all beauty, and naturally, Tripakra was attract attracted to him. However, the Lord's beauty is spiritual and pure, and his intention was not to gratify himself with Trivikra, but rather to bring her to the point of pure spiritual existence, Krishna consciousness. Text 10. Promising her the fulfillment of this lusty desire, considerate Krishna, Lord of all beings, paid Trivikra his respects and then returned with Uddhava to his own supremely opulent residence. Purport. All the Acharyas agree that the words Kama Vadam Tattva indicate that Lord Krishna promised Trivikra he would full, fulfill her lusty desires. Text 11. Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Lord of all Lords, is ordinarily difficult to approach. One who has properly worshipped him and then chooses the benediction of mundane sense gratification of poor intelligence, for he is satisfied with an insignificant result. Purport. It is clear from the commentaries of the Acharyas that the story of Trivikra is to be understood on two levels. On the one hand, she is understood to be a liberated directly associating with the Lord and participating in his pastimes. On the other hand, her conduct is clearly meant to teach a lesson about what not to do in relation with Lord Krishna. Since all of the Lord's pastimes are not only blissful, but also didactic, there is no real contradiction in this pastime, since Trivakra's purity and her bad example take place at distinct levels. Arjuna is also considered a pure devotee, yet by initially disobeying Krishna's instruction to fight, he also showed an example of what not to do. However, such bad examples always have happy endings in the blissful association of the Absolute Truth, Sri Krishna. Text 12 Then Lord Krishna wanting to have some things then Lord Krishna, wanting to have some things done, went to Akrura's house with Balaram and Uddhava. The Lord also desired to please Akrura. Purport The previous incident of Lord Krishna's visit to Trivikra's house and now his visit to Akrura's gives a fascinating glimpse into the daily activities of Sri Krishna in Mathura city. Text 13 and 14. Akrura stood up in great joy when he saw them, his own relatives and the greatest of exalted personalities coming from a distance. After embracing them and greeting them, Akrura bowed down to Krishna and Balarama and was greeted by them in return. Then, when his, when his guests had taken their seats, he worshipped them in accordance with scriptural rules. Purport Srila Jiva Goswami points out that Lord Sri Krishna and the others approached Akrura in a friendly attitude. At first, Akrura re reciprocated that friendly mood, and then in the course of showing them hospitality, he adopted his natural devotional attitude toward the Lord and thus offered his obeisances to Sri Krishna and Sri Balaram. Text 15 and 16 O King, Akrura bathed the feet of Lord Krishna and Lord Balarama and then poured the bath water on his head. He presented them with gifts of fine clothing, aromatic sandalwood paste, flower garlands and excellent jewelry. 
After thus worshipping the two lords, he bowed his head to the floor. Then he began to massage Lord Krishna's feet, placing them on his lap, and with his head bowed in humility, he addressed Krishna and Balarama as follows. Text 17 Akrura said, It is our good fortune that you two lords have killed the evil Kangsa and his followers, thus delivering your dynasty from endless suffering and causing it to flourish. Text 18 <clears throat> You both are the original Supreme Person, the cause of the universe and its very substance. Not the slightest subtle cause or manifest product of creation exists apart from you. Purport. <clears throat> After praising Krishna and Balarama for having saved their dynasty, Akrura now points out that the Lord actually has no mundane connection with any social or political institution. He is the original personality of Godhead, performing his pastimes for the benefit of the entire universe. Text 19 O Supreme Absolute Truth, with your personal energies you create this universe and then enter into it. Thus one can perceive you in many different forms by hearing from authorities and by direct experience. Purport The, the grammatical agreement of Shruta Pratyaksha Gocharam in the neuter gender <clears throat> with Atma Shrishtam Idam Vishwam indicates that the Supreme Lord, by entering his creation with his potencies, makes himself perceivable within the universe. Throughout the Bhagavatam and other authorized Vedic literatures, Often find descriptions of the Lord's simultaneous supremacy over all other things and his identity with them. We cannot reasonably draw any other conclusion from the Vedic literature than the one powerfully preached by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Achintya Beda Beda Tattva. That is, the absolute truth is greater than and distinct from everything since he is the omnipotent creator and controller of all, and simultaneously one with everything, since all that exists is the expansion of his own power. Throughout these chapters of Srimad Bhagavatam, we also observe one of the unique, extraordinary features of this great work. Whether Krishna is sending his message to the gopis or accepting the prayers of Akrura, there is a constant philosophical discussion. Throughout the Bhagavatam, <clears throat> the steady combination of fascinating pastimes with persistent spiritual philosophy is an extraordinary feature. We are allowed to glimpse and even to relish the spiritual emotion of the Lord and His liberated associates, and yet we are constantly reminded of their ontological position lest we lapse into a cheap, anthropomorphic vision. Thus it is entirely in character with the work <laughs> that Akrura, in his ecstasy, glorifies the Lord with precise philosophical prayers. <clears throat> Text 20 Just as the primary elements, earth and so on, manifest themselves in abundant variety among all the species of mobile and immobile life, so you, the one independent supreme Lord soul, so you, the one independent supreme soul, appear to be manifold among the variegated objects of your creation. Text 21. You create, destroy and also maintain this universe with your personal energies, 
the modes of passion, ignorance, and goodness, yet you are never entangled by these modes or the activities they generate. Since you are the original source of all knowledge, what could ever cause you to be bound by illusion? Purport. <clears throat> the phrase, Jnanat manas te kwa jabande he tu. Since you are constituted of knowledge, what could be a cause of bondage for you? It definitely indicates the obvious that the omniscient Supreme God is never in illusion. Therefore, the impersonalistic theory that we are all God but have forgotten and are now in illusion is refuted here in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. Text 22 Since it has never been demonstrated that you are covered by material bodily designations, it must be concluded that for you there is neither birth in a literal sense nor any duality. Therefore you never undergo bondage or liberation, and if you appear to, and if you appear to, it is only because of your desire that we see you in that way, or simply because of our lack of discrimination. Purport. Here Akrura states two reasons why the Lord appears to be covered by a material form or to take birth like a human being. First, when Lord Krishna executes his pastimes, his loving devotees think of him as their beloved child, friend, lover, and so on. In the ecstasy of, it, of this loving reciprocation, they do not think of Krishna as God. For example, because of her extraordinary love for him, Mother Yashoda worries that Krishna will be injured in the forest. That she feels this way is the desire of the Lord, which is here indicated by the word nikama. The second reason the Lord may appear material is indicated by the word aviveka, simply because of ignorance, a lack of discrimination. One may, be mis one may misunderstand the position of, this, of the personality of Godhead. In the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, in Lord Krishna's discussion with Sri Uddhava, the Lord elaborately discusses his transcendental position beyond bondage and liberation. As stated in Vedic literature, Dehe Dehi Vibhago Yam Neshwade Vidyate Kuchit There is never a distinction of body and soul in the Supreme Lord. In other words, Sri Krishna's body is eternal, spiritual, omniscient, and the reservoir of all pleasure. Text 23 <coughs> You originally enunciated the ancient religious path of the Vedas for the benefit of the whole universe. Whenever that path becomes obstructed, by wicked persons following the path of atheism, you assume one of your incarnations, which are all in the transcendental mode of goodness. 24. You are that very same Supreme Person, my Lord, and you have now appeared in the home of Vasudev with your plenary portion. You have done this to relieve the earth's burden of killing hundreds of armies led by kings who are expansions of the demigod's enemies, and also to spread the fame of our dynasty. Purport The term Suritarangsha Ragyam indicates that the demoniac kings slain by Krishna were in fact expansions or incarnations of the enemies of the demigods. This fact is elaborately explained in the Mahabharat, which reveals the specific identities of the demoniac kings. Text 25 Today, O Lord, my home has become most fortunate because you have entered it. As the supreme truth, you embody the forefathers, ordinary creatures, 
human beings and demigods, and the water that has washed your feet purifies the three worlds. Indeed, O transcendent one, you are the spiritual master of the universe. Purport. <clears throat> Srila Sridhar Swami has nicely interpreted Akrura's feelings as follows. Akrura said, My Lord, although I am a householder, today my home has become more pious than the forests where sages perform austerities. Why? Simply because you have entered my home. Indeed, you are the personification of the deities who preside over the five sacrifices a householder must perform daily to atone for unavoidable violence committed to living beings in the home. You are the spiritual truth behind all these creations, and now you have entered my home. The five daily sacrifices enjoined for a householder are 1. Sacrifice to Brahman by studying the Vedas. 2. Sacrifice to the forefathers by making offerings to them. 3. Sacrifice to all creatures by putting aside a portion of one's meals. 4. Sacrifice to human beings by extending hospitality. And 5. Sacrifice to the demigods by performing fire sacrifices and so on. Text 26. That may be the only place where those five are mentioned explicitly, isn't it? You've heard, you, we hear about um, this a lot about the five, uh, you know, what's the word? Sacrifices that are obligatory for the householder. And now we've heard these, these are the five. I'll repeat them again just so, that, so they'll sink in. The five daily sacrifices enjoined for a householder are 1. Sacrifice to Brahman by studying the Vedas. 2. Sacrifice to the forefathers by making offerings to them. 3. Sacrifice to all creatures by putting aside a portion of one's meals. 4. Sacrifice to human beings by extending hospitality. And 5. Sacrifice to the demigods by performing fire sacrifices. And so on. Text 26. What learned person would approach anyone but you for shelter when you are the affectionate, grateful, and truthful well-wisher of your devotees. To those who worship you in sincere friendship, you reward everything they desire, even your own self, yet you never increase or diminish. PURPORT This verse describes both the Lord and His devotees as surida, well-wishers. <clears throat> the Lord is the well-wisher of His devotee. And the devotee lovingly desires all happiness for the Lord. Even in this world, an excess of love may sometimes produce unnecessary solicitude. For example, we often observe that a mother's loving concern for her adult child <clears throat> is not always justified by an actual danger to the child. A grown child may be wealthy, competent, and healthy, and yet the mother's loving concern continues. Similarly, your devotee always feels loving concern for Lord Krishna as exemplified by Mother Yashoda, who could only think of Krishna as her beautiful son. Lord Krishna had promised to Krura that after killing Kangsa, he would visit his home, and now the Lord kept his promise. Akrura recognizes this, and glorifies the Lord as Ritagira, one who is true to his word. Ritagira, one who is true to his word. Ah. The Lord is Kritagya, grateful for whatever little worship a devotee, a devotee offers. And even if the devotee forgets, 
the Lord does not. Rita Gira, Rita Gira, Rita Gira. Hmm. Text 27. It is by our great fortune, Janardhan, that you are now visible to us. For even the masters of yoga and the foremost demigods can achieve this goal only with great difficulty. Please quickly cut the ropes of our illusory attachment for children, wife, wealth, influential friends, home, and body. All such attachment is simply the effect of your illusory material energy. Text 28. Chukadev Goswami continued, Thus worshipped and fully glorified by his devotee, the Supreme Lord Hari smilingly addressed Akrura, completely charming him with his words. Text 29. The Supreme Lord said, You are our spiritual master, paternal uncle, and praiseworthy friend, and we are like your sons always dependent on your protection, sustenance, and compassion. 30. Exalted souls like you are the true objects of service and the most worshipable authorities for those who desire the highest good in life. Demigods are generally concerned with their own self-interests, but saintly devotees never are. Purport. Whereas demigods may award material benefit, saintly devotees of the Lord have the power to award the real perfection of life, Krishna consciousness. Thus Lord Krishna reinforces the respectful mood he had adopted here, he has adopted here, toward his uncle Rakura. Text 31 No one can deny that there are holy places with sacred rivers, or that the demigods appear in deity forms made of earth and stone. But these purify the soul only after a long time, whereas saintly persons purify just by being seen. In the wonderful verse, I'm going to repeat this if you don't mind. Anybody minds? This is a very important verse. Na yam mayani tirtani na deva mrich chila mayaha te punan turu kalena darshad evasadavaha. No one can deny that there are holy places with sacred rivers or that, this, or that the demigods appear in deity forms made of earth and stone. But these purify the soul only after a long time, whereas saintly persons purify just by being seen. Text 32 You are indeed the best of our friends, so please go to Hastinapur and as the well-wisher of the Pandavas, find out how they are doing. Purport in Sanskrit, the imperative you go may be rendered by gachchaswa or gachcha. In the second of these cases, the word following gachcha, namely swa, which is taken in evocative sense, indicates Krishna addressing Akrura as our own. This is in reference to Lord Krishna's intimate relationship with his uncle. 33. We have heard that when the fa- when we have heard that when their father passed away, the young Pandavas were brought with their anguished mother to the capital city by King Dhritarashtra, and that they are now living there. Thirty four. Indeed, weak minded Dhritarashtra, the son of Ambika, has come under the control of his wicked sons, and therefore that blind king is not treating his brother's sons fairly. 35. Go and see 
whether Dhritarashtra is acting properly or not. When we find out, we will make the necessary arrangements to help our dear friends. 36. Shukadev Goswami continued, Thus, fully instructing Akrura, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari, then returned to his residence, accompanied by Lord Sankarshan and Uddhava. Thus end the purports of the humble servants of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to the 10th canto, 48th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, Krishna Pleases His Devotees. <laughs> Jai Sri Krishna, the kindness of Sri Krishna being poured upon His devotees. Hare Krishna, well done. Krishna, well done. So we can see by this chapter that, you know, whatever the relationship is, and whatever Krishna loves everyone, and he expresses that love in different ways, but with the same level of intensity and affection. Okay, now we're at 10 till 4, 10 till 5. We're doing pretty good. I think we'll go through the next one. Okay. Moving right along to, to chapter 49. <clears throat> Akrura's mission in Hastinapur. This chapter describes how Akrura went to Hastinapur. Sri unfair behavior toward his nephews, the Pandavas, and then returned to Mathura. On the order of Lord Krishna, Akrura went to Hastinapur, where he met the Kauravas and then set about to find out how Dhritarashtra was treating the latter. This task would keep Akrura in Hastinapur for several months. Vidura and Kuntidevi described Akrura in detail how Dhritarashtra's sons, envious of the exalted qualities of the Pandavas, had tried to destroy by various evil means and were contemplating further atrocities. With tearful eyes, Kunti Devi asked Akrura, Do my parents and other relatives headed by Krishna and Balarama ever think of me and my sons? And will Krishna ever come to console us in our distress? Then Kunti Devi began to chant Lord Krishna's names for her protection. And she also chanted mantras expressing surrender to him. Akrura assured Kunti Devi, Since your sons were born from demigods like Dharma and Vayu, there is no reason to expect that any misfortune will befall them. Rather, you should be confident that very soon they will receive the greatest possible good fortune. Akrura then delivered to Dhritarashtra the message from Krishna and Balarama. Akrura told the king, You have assumed the royal throne after the death of Pandu. Seeing all equally, which is the religious duty of kings, you should protect all your subjects in personal relations. By such fair behavior, you will gain all fame and good fortune. But if you act otherwise, you will attain only infamy in this life and the condemnation to a hellish existence in the next. A living being takes his birth all alone, and alone he gives up his life. Alone he enjoys the fruits of his piety and sin. If one fails to understand the true identity of the self and instead maintains his progeny, by indulging in evil deeds, then surely he will go to hell. One should therefore learn to understand the unsteadiness of material existence, which is like a sleeper's dream, a magician's illusion, or a fight, a flight, of fancy, and should thus control his mind in order to remain peaceful and equipoised. To this Dhritarashtra replied, I cannot hear enough of your beneficial words, O Akrura. 
which are like the sweet nectar of immortality. But because the tight knot of affection for my sons has made me biased toward them, your statements cannot become fixed within my mind. No one can transgress the arrangement of the Supreme Lord. His purpose for descending into the Yadu dynasty will inevitably be fulfilled. Knowing now the mentality of Dhritarashtra, Akrura took permission from his dear relatives and friends and returned to Mathura, where he related everything to Lord Krishna and Lord Balarama. Text 1 and 2. Shukadev Goswami said, Okrura then went to Hastinapur, the city distinguished by the glory of the Parava rulers. There he saw Dhritarashtra, Bhishma, Vidura and Kunti, along with Balika and his son Somadatta. He also saw Dronacharya, Kripacharya, Karna, Duryodhana, Ashwatthama, the Pandavas and other close friends. Text 3. After Akrura, the son of Gandini, had appropriately greeted all his relatives and friends, they asked him for news of their family members, and in turn, and he in turn, asked about their welfare. Text 4. He remained in Hastinapur for several months to scrutinize the conduct of the weak willed king, who had bad sons and who was inclined to give in to the whims of mischievous advisers. 5 and 6. Kunti and Vidura described to Akrura in detail the evil intentions of Dhritarashtra's sons, who could not tolerate the great qualities of Kunti's sons, such as their powerful influence, military skill, physical strength, bravery, and humility or the intense affection the citizens had for them. Kunti and Vidura, Kunti and Vidura also told Akrura about how the sons of Dhritarashtra had tried to poison the Pandavas and carry out other such plots. Text 7 Kunti Devi, taking advantage of her brother Akrura's visit, approached him confidentially while remembering her birthplace. She spoke with tears in her eyes. Text 8 Queen Kunti said, O gentle one, do my parents, brothers, sisters, nephews, family women, and girlhood friends still remember us? 9 Does my nephew Krishna, the Supreme Personality and the compassionate shelter of his devotees, still remember his aunt's sons? Does the, does the lotus-eyed Rama remember them also? Now that I am suffering in the midst of my enemies, like a doe in the midst of wolves, will Krishna come to console me with my fatherless sons with his words? Text 11 Krishna, Krishna, O great yogi, O Supreme Soul and Protector of the Universe, O Govinda, please protect me, who have surrendered to you. I and my sons are being overwhelmed by trouble. Purport. Since Lord Krishna maintains the entire universe, thought Kunti Devi, surely he can protect our family. The word Avasidatim indicates that Kunti Devi was overwhelmed by troubles. Thus exhausted, she was helplessly taking shelter of Sri Krishna. In her prayers in the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Kunti admits that all these troubles were actually a blessing, for they forced her to always be intensely Krishna conscious. Text 12 For persons fearful of death and rebirth, I see no shelter other than your liberating lotus feet, for you are the Supreme Lord. 13. I offer my obeisances unto you, Krishna, the Supreme Pure, the Absolute Truth, and the Super Soul, the Lord of pure devotional service, and the source of all knowledge. I have come to you for shelter. Purport. 
Srila Sridhar Swami has explained that the word yogaya means unto the source of knowledge. The word yoga indi indicates connection and also the means to achieve something. As conscious souls, we have a connection with the Supreme Lord through bhakti or devotion. Through that relationship, we experience perfect knowledge of the Supreme Soul. Since the Supreme Soul is the Absolute Truth, perfect knowledge of Him means perfect knowledge of everything. As stated in the Mundaka Upanishad 113, Kasmin nu bhagavo vigyate sarvam idam vigyatam babatiti. When the Absolute Truth is understood, everything is understood. Thus, Lord Krishna Himself by his spiritual potency, establishes our connection with him, and that connection is the source of all spiritual knowledge. Thus, Acharya Sridhar, by his thoughtful explanation, stimulates us to deeper understanding of Krishna conscious philosophy. Jai Sridhar Swami Ki Jai. Text 14. Shukadev <clears throat> Goswami said, Thus meditating on her family members and also on Krishna, the Lord of the universe, your great-grandmother Kunti Devi began to cry out in grief, O King. Text 15. Both the Prura, who shared Queen Kunti's distress and happiness, and the illustrious Vidura, consoled the Queen by reminding her of her extraordinary way of the both, both the Krura, who shared Queen Kunti's distress and happiness, and the, illust and the illustrious Vidura, consoled the Queen by reminding her of the extraordinary way her sons had taken birth. Purport. A Krura and Vidura reminded Queen Kunti that her sons were born of heavenly gods and thus could not be vanquished like ordinary mortals. In fact, an extraordinary victory awaited this most pious family. 16. The ardent affection King Dhritarashtra felt for his sons had made him act unjustly toward the Pandavas. Just before leaving, Akrura approached the king, who was seated among his friends and supporters, and related to him the message of his relatives, Lord Krishna and Lord Balarama had sent out of friendship. Text 17 Akrura said, My dear son of Vichitravirya, O enhancer of the Kurus, O enhancer of the Kurus glory, your Pandu having passed away, you have now assumed the royal throne. Purport Akrura was speaking ironically, since the young sons of Pandu should actually have been occupying the throne. Upon the death of Pandu, they were too young to immediately govern and so were put into Dhritarashtra's care. But now sufficient time had passed and their legitimate rights should have been recognized. Text 18 By religiously protecting the earth, delighting your subjects with your noble character and treating all your relatives equally, all your relatives equally, you will surely achieve success and glory. Purport. Akrura told Dhritarashtra that even though he had usurped the throne, if he now ruled according to the principles of Dharma and behaved properly, he could be successful. Text 19. If you act otherwise, however, people will condemn you in this world, and in the next, you will enter the darkness of hell. Remain equally disposed, therefore, toward Pandu's sons and your own. Purport Dhritarashtra's whole problem was his excessive attachment to his nasty sons. That was the fatal flaw that caused his downfall. There was no lack of good advice from all sides, and Dhritarashtra even admitted that the advice was sound, but he could not follow it. One can have clear, practical intelligence when the mind 
and heart are pure. Text 20. In this world, no one has any permanent relationship with anyone else, O king. We cannot stay forever, even with our own body. What to speak of our wife, children, and the rest? 21. Every creature is born alone and dies alone. And alone one experiences the just rewards of his good and evil deeds. Purport. The term anubhumte is significant here. Bhumte means the living being. Bhumte means the living being experiences. And anu means following or in sequence. In other words, we experience happiness and distress according to the moral and spiritual quality of our activities. We are responsible for what we do. Dhritarashtra was falsely and obsessively attached to his evil-minded sons, forgetting that he alone would have to suffer alone for his impudent behavior. Text 22 In the guise of dear dependents, strangers, Steal the sin in the guise of dear dependence, strangers steal the sinfully acquired wealth of a foolish man, just as the offspring of a fish drink up the water that sustains the fish. Purport Ordinary people they cannot live without their wealth, although their possession of it is circumstantial and temporary, just as wealth gives life. To an ordinary man, water gives life to a fish. One's dear dependents, however, steal one's wealth, just as a fish's offspring drink up the water sustaining the fish. In the words of Srila Bhaktivedanta Thakur, this world is a weird abode. <laughs> Text 23. A fool indulges in sin to maintain his life, wealth, and children, and other relatives, for he thinks, these things are mine. In the end, however, these very things all abandon him, leaving him frustrated. Purport In these verses, Akrura is giving rather frank advice to Dhritarashtra. Those who know the story of the Mahabharata will realize how relevant and prophetic these instructions are, and how much Dhritarashtra suffered for not accepting them. Although one tenaciously clings to his property, in the end all is lost, and the blundering soul is swept away by the wheel of birth and death. Text 24 <clears throat> Abandoning his so-called dependence, ignorant of the actual goal of life, indifferent to his real duty and having failed to fulfill his purposes, the foolish soul enters the blindness of hell, taking his sinful reactions with him. Purport It is sadly ironic that materialistic persons who labor so assiduously, assiduously to accumulate insurance I'll read that again. It is sadly ironic that materialistic persons who labor so assiduously to accumulate insurance, security, property, and family enter the darkness of hell equipped with nothing but the painfully reactions of their sins. On the other hand, those who cultivate Krishna consciousness, spiritual life, while apparently neglecting to accumulate property, a large family, and so on, enter the next life enriched with many spiritual assets, and thus enjoy the deep pleasures of the soul. What a nice purport! Wow! I gotta read that again. Purport. It is sadly ironic that materialistic persons who labor so assiduously to accumulate insurance, security, property, and family enter the darkness of hell equipped with nothing but the pain of the actions of their sins. On the other hand, those who cultivate Krishna consciousness, spiritual life, while apparently neglecting to accumulate property, a large family, and so on, 
enter the next life enriched with many spiritual assets and thus enjoy the deep pleasures of the soul. 25. Therefore, O king, looking upon this world as a dream, a magician's illusion, or a flight of fancy, please control your mind with intelligence and become equipoised and peaceful, my lord. Text 26. Dhritarashtra said, O master of charity, I can never be satiated at, while hearing your auspicious words. Indeed, I am like a mortal who has obtained the nectar of the gods. Purport. In the opinion of Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti, Vritarashtra was in fact proud, and he felt he already knew everything Akrur was speaking. But to maintain diplomatic gravity, he spoke as a saintly gentleman. Mm. Hmm. Text 27. <clears throat> Even so, gentle Akrura, because my unsteady heart is prejudiced by affection for my sons, these pleasing words of yours cannot remain fixed there, just as lightning cannot remain fixed in a cloud. 28. Who can defy the injunctions of the Supreme Lord, who has now descended in the Yadu dynasty to diminish the earth's burden? Report. Naturally, we would like to ask Dhritarashtra, if you know all this, why don't you behave properly? Of course, this is exactly Dhritarashtra's point. He feels that since events have already been set in motion, he is helpless to change them. <clears throat> in fact, events have been set in motion by his attachment and sinful propensities, and therefore he should have taken responsibility for his own acts. Lord Krishna clearly states in the Bhagavad Gita 15, 515, <clears throat> The Supreme Lord does not accept responsibility for anyone's sinful activities. It is a dangerous policy to claim that we are acting improperly because of destiny or fate. We should take up Krishna consciousness seriously and create an auspicious future for ourselves and our associates. Finally, one may argue that after all, Dhritarashtra is involved in the Lord's pastimes <clears throat> and is actually his eternal associate. In answer to this, we may say that the Lord's pastimes are not only entertaining, but also, but also didactic. And the lesson here, Dhritarashtra should have acted acted properly. This is what the Lord wanted to teach. Dhritarashtra claims that Krishna came to relieve the burden of the earth, but the earth's burden is precisely the improper behavior of its inhabitants. So let us take the lesson the Lord wants to teach here and be instructed for our benefit. 29. I offer my obeisances to Him, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who creates this universe by the inconceivable activity of His material energy, and then distributes the various modes of nature by entering within the creation. From Him, the meaning of whose pastimes is unfathomable, unfathomable. From Him, the meaning of whose pastimes is unfathomable. Both come both the entangling cycle of birth and death and the process of deliverance from it. Purport. When all is said and done, Dhritarashtra was not an ordinary person, but an associate of the Supreme Lord Krishna. Certainly an ordinary person could not offer such a learned hymn to the Lord. 30. Shukadeva Goswami said, Having thus apprised himself of the king's attitude, Akrura, the descendant of Yadu, took permission from his well-wishing relatives and friends and returned to the capital of the Yadavas. Akrura reported to Lord Balarama and Lord Krishna how Dhritarashtra was behaving toward the Pandavas. 
Thus, O descendant of the Kurus, he, fulf he fulfilled the purpose for which he had been sent. Thus end the purports of the humble servants of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to the 10th canto, 49th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam entitled, A Kuru's Mission in Hanukkah. <laughs> oh, Kunti Devi Ki Jai, Arjuna Dutta Rashtra Nima, Sahade Ki Jai, A Kuru Ki Jai, Lord Sri Krishna Valaram Ki Jai, the plot thickens, the plot thickens. Hare Krishna. Okay, so we'll stop here for tonight, the reading. And if anyone has any points that came into their mind, stuck in their mind, the reading was going on. Each one of these readings is, you know, pregnant. Points and wonderful points. Yes, we're going to start. Pranata Gruna is going to start us off. Thank you. Uh, the section we read when uh, the purport about Dhritarashtra having good advice from all sides, but yet he was still kind of fixed in his way of acting and thinking. It reminded me of in the Bhagavad Gita, um, Duryodhana, despite so many signs that they're destined to lose the battle, he was still kind of disregarding that and just pressing forward. And um, so I was thinking about this kind of... Um, you know, way of thinking and kind of, you know, I, we, I can kind of see it in myself and um, just kind of reflecting on that a little bit. I don't know if you have any more insight or thoughts on that. <clears throat> well, I mean, this is a pretty basic point, you know, and... Uh, The point that's being made again and again is that if one is pious, then the tendency will be to see reversals in life as the mercy of the Lord and still be able to do the right thing. But if, but if one is conducted by impiety, then even if he gets good advice, he can't accept it because he can't keep it in his heart. Because when the heart is uh, polluted or, or, you know, or overcome with attachment to something, in this case, it's the attachment to his sons, especially Duryodhana, who is a rascal. He's actually evil. So when your mind and heart are attached to something evil, then the truth cannot fix itself in your heart. That's the point that's being made. You know, I, I got a, a letter from uh, Chandrasekhar from Hong Kong, and he wants me to write a letter to the devotees there because there's a lot of violent things going on in Hong Kong, which is really unusual for Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a real stable. It's one of the, one of the maybe three or four or five of the financial centers of the world it's so built up and so developed and so first world but now it's been taken over by you know China and China has you know different policies and one of them is they don't approve of religious things so when when the devotees have seen all this kind of unjust violence and behavior going on you know and some of them see both sides like that but in any case you know the tendency is to become disturbed and uh, there was something in the beginning of uh, our reading of these chapters that I thought applied 
to that situation in particular because Chandrasekhar wants me to write something to read out to the devotees to help their minds become equipoised. And uh, the thing is that nothing is actually unfair in the material world. We think of things as being unfair because of our own attachments and our own relationship and our own uh, philosophical bent of saying things. But the fact is that every single person in the universe, and that's why that report, that, that point was made, huh? we come in with nothing and we go out with nothing. And in the meantime, everything that we get attracted to, everything that we have that's nice, everything that we have is not nice, it all just goes away. Everything just goes away. That's the ephemeral nature of material existence. And when we actually assimilate this philosophy and log on to that thought and embrace it in our hearts, due to what? Attachment to Krishna and, and detachment from what's not, you know, nice. Raga dvesha vimuktais too. Raga dvesha, attachment and aversion have to be vimuktais too, given up, in order for us to actually follow spiritual principles. And Prabhupada defines them as the regulated principles of freedom. So to become free, we have to become free from the pious and the impious, both and attached to the lotus feet of Krishna, then we can see things in proper perspective. Then we can see even reversals as, as coming from Krishna to help us. What was it the point was made? Sometimes Dhritarashtra was doing something that is an example not to be followed, even though he's an associate of Krishna. You know, what did Prahlad Maharaj do? What was his what was his fault? Chanting Hare Krishna, you know, glorifying Krishna, and yet his father wanted to kill him. Seeming completely unfair and unjust and whatever, but then what happened? He showed us what how to how to act under the most dire difficulty. So this is the contrast, Dhritarashtra and Prahlad. And you can see clearly how to think, how to feel, how to will, how to act under any circumstance, and no matter how extreme. And then the truth will sink in and will be able to be embraced by our heart. It will become fixed. Whereas in Dhritarashtra's heart, it would just come in and he knew it was right, but it would just it would fall away. It didn't stick. It didn't stay with him because he was too attached to his evil son. What did Prabhupada say? That takes a little spiritual intelligence. <laughs> Do we have any uh, have some things from cyberspace? Okay, this is Rati Manjari. <coughs> so, dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my respectful obeisances. Thank you for another very instructive reading, which is flowing over with meaning about how to be and how not to be. What I appreciate especially about these chapters are the various descriptions of the kindness of Sri Krishna and the beautiful names he is being called, such as the Lord of Freedom, and that even though we, in that even though we forget whatever small service we may have accidentally rendered to him, the Lord remembers. Mm -hmm. It is so encouraging to learn more and more about the character of the Lord whom we are trying to serve. Thank you, Radhi. That was wonderful. I have nothing more to say about that. That was very nice. Krishna never forgets. We forget, but he never forgets us. That's a pillar 
of uh, understanding that, that takes us forward in Krishna consciousness. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Beautiful. You can see that these books are like gold mines and we just have to mine these wines, you know. And not be misers and just take them out glittering and look at them and then put them back in the treasure chest, but actually use them. And then we then eventually will become Jai Shri. Oh, this is Jai Shri. <coughs> Just a reflection. We need to learn to attach to Krishna only and detach this from. This is from Jai Shri. Say it. Yeah. This is from Jai Shri. From Hong Kong. From Hong Kong. From Hong Kong. From Hong Kong. We need to learn to attach to Krishna only and detach from any other things in the material world. Your servant, Jai Shri. Yes. And I, I'm sure you were listening, but I got Jai Shri, but I got a letter from Chandrasekhar, and he wants me to write something to be read out to the devotees who are must be quite disturbed by <clears throat> recent events <clears throat> happening in Hong Kong and how to uh, keep our equilibrium. So I will do that. I think he's having a meeting by the 1st of December, so I'll, I'll write something substantial. Yeah, yes, that's the secret, not to be attached. Because, you know, and not to think that we can renounce either, because nothing belongs to us. <laughs> nothing belongs to us, and everything that is here is temporary and ephemeral. Okay, I'm going to stop here tonight. We're uh, getting ready tomorrow, and then the next morning we're leaving Govardhan, sadly, uh, to Hastinapur. And we're following Akrura's footsteps. He got sent to Hastinapur, but we're not going to do any, you know, like polit polit politicking and reconnaissance, you know, adventures. We're just going to go there. And uh, that's the day after tomorrow. So day after tomorrow, we'll change the time of our reading from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock India Standard Time. That'll be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay, you can put that in your calendars. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, we will be reading at 6 o'clock. That's two hours later than we have been reading Indian Standard Time. And then the next day we fly out in the morning and I don't think we'll be able to read, unfortunately, because the plane arrives at 3, and by the time we get out and get the bags and drive all the way to Folkestone, it'll be late. So we'll we'll skip that one day on the 25th, which is Monday? Monday. So the next day we'll be uh, reading again is Tuesday in Folkestone at 6 o'clock UK time. All right, that's our agenda for the next few days anyway. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I had, a, as I already told you in the beginning of this <laughs> reading, I had a wonderful discussion with um, um, Gopinath Prasad, disciple of uh, Brijan Prabhu, who's here, helping him in the, with the tech, technological aspects of his uh, retreats. And he's very, very expert. And he's extremely in, inspired by what we're doing and the, the, the product that we have already done. And he wants to help. So stay tuned for emails coming your way and being, you know, anybody who wants to help may be added to the thread and we'll develop a team and spread this unique product that we've created by all of your mercy. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. All glories to Kubja. All glories to Rakrura. All glories to Uddhava. All glories to Krishna Balaram. All glories to the Pandavas. And all of Krishna's wonderful adventures in his um, Leela and his earth. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Gaur Premanandi. See you tomorrow night, 4 o'clock. Same place, same station. Hare Krishna.